Hello, and welcome to the second episode of Legacies of Lore, brought to you by MTG Training Grounds, the educational series dedicated to providing you with all the info on popular decks, strategies, insight, and more for the Legacy format. I am your host, Zachary Cuck. Today, I bring you young guest of up-and-coming stardom. At only 18 years old, his resume is impressive and includes six Star City Games Open Top 8s, one Star City Game Invitational Top 8, resulting in a win. He is a one-time Star City Game Player Championship competitor. He has three performances at the uh, Pro Tour and one Grand Prix Top 16. He's currently a criminal justice major at East Carolina University. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dylan Donegan. Dilligan? Hey, uh, hey Dylan, what's up, guys? Welcome to the program. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no worries. That's not the first time I've heard that. Ah, what's up, right. guys? I'm happy to be here. All right. So we are doing this interview for Legacy Zalore, my, my webcast, podcast, whatever. Um, and you are the featured guest here to talk about Delver decks. You've played quite a few of these yourself, right? Yeah, I've played basically all the, all the variations you can. So let's start it off. Let's, let's dig right in. What is a Delver deck? Like, how, how do they work? Where did they come from? And, and, and what, are they, what are they trying to do? Um, okay, so Del the Delver deck is basically your stereotypical uh, aggro control deck where I kind of, when people ask me, like, what does it play out like? And Andy Boswell is someone who, who mentioned this to me, and it's very true. It kind of plays out almost like an Obzon aggro deck in standard. You know, obviously the cards are very, very different, but you stick a threat or two and you, you answer all your opponent's cards and you ride that threat to victory. Um, so it's very tempo-based, and uh, yeah, that's really about it, honestly. So so a tempo deck. Where, d <laughs> explain a little bit more. How, how does a tempo deck operate? Like, what is, what is what do you mean when you say a tempo deck? So a tempo deck uh, leverages, like, it plays some cards that normally, like, aren't traditionally great just because it leverages the fact that you're taking an aggressive start to the game, you know, when you're wastelanding your opponent and you're putting them under pressure, cards like Daze and Forza will get a lot better because you can use that tempo and the card disadvantage you get from a card like Forza will to your advantage. Right now I've heard I've heard um, it described that way where a tempo deck is trying to utilize the fact that you can end the game before your opponent's uh, game plan gets, you know, fully, fully, uh, activated or fully you know um, yeah. going on that's a great that's a great point and uh it's that that being said it's very common for a delver player to end the game and with your opponent having five or six cards in hand because you've just run them over to before they could deploy all their things right and i, I know there's been a, a myriad of articles written on that and most of them they emphasize that point that if you have a hand or a game that ends with five cards in your hand you basically just didn't draw five cards. You you may have had a three or four card hand because that was all you ever played, right? Exactly, and you get to make up for your card disadvantage by just killing them with five cards, man. So right, it's kind so, of card advantage in its own way. Yeah, I mean, and, and and that's true. So in in Legacy, then what what do Delver decks look like? We'll we'll stay broad here, and then and then go into some specifics later. Like what are what are the the quintessential spells, and and why are they important to the to the archetype? Sure. So um. Yeah, it's kind of funny because almost all, even just blue decks, share about a common core of 30 to 40 cards in Legacy. And the rest of your deck is, um, you know, how you want to kill people and how to work around those cards, you know. Um, so the Delver deck, the, the like staple four ofs are Daze, Forcible, Brainstorm, Ponder, in my opinion, Lightning Bolt, even though you, you can play uh, Soltai Delver if you want, uh, Delver of Secrets. Um, normally you commonly see another one drop creature, whether it be Deathrite Shaman or Monastery Swift Spear, Nimble Mongoose. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, there's about 30, 30 ish cards that are locks in the deck, Wasteland included. Mm -hmm. Um, so those, all those cards, you really can't cut any of them. So those are the staples of the archetype. And, and for each one of those, we'll, let, let, let's go with, uh, first you have what they, what's typically termed the, the, uh, the cantrip cartel. You've got Ponder. Um, brainstorm, and then sometimes cards like Gitaxian Probe, or I guess Preordain, not so much in Delver Thought decks. Scour is not uncommon to see. Thought Scour, that's another good one. Mm -hmm. Why are those important to the deck? Well, Brainstorm is just the best card in Legacy. If you've sure. played it, you, sh you probably know that. Mm -hmm. um, and Ponder is another one. Um, I think it's... I've seen people trim down on Ponders, but it's really important for... You know, you, you, the deck plays a really low land count. Normally you don't see a Delver deck with more than 19 lands. And 
it's really important for making sure you can hit your land drops early and just being able like the Delver decks have a great long game even though you have a lot of cards that aren't great late game top decks because of all these cantrips you just always get to filter through your deck and find exactly what you need at, the, at what points in the game and that's why you can put up a long game fight versus a deck like miracles or shardless where all their card the card quality in their deck is much higher but you're you have all these cantrips and you get to see so much of your deck and you get to find exactly what you need at certain moments so right so so again with the idea of a tempo deck utilizing um the right things at the right time whereas a, a slower more more powerful deck may not be able to always have the right cards at the right time they just have mm -hmm. more raw power that that if if it comes online it's probably great but there's going to be some number of games where they just don't have it like when they exactly. need it exactly and there's a lot of advantages to both those things so so um let's go to the next uh, you said that we we're gonna have well obviously we're gonna have delver secrets that's sort of the name namesake creature of the deck um but some of the others you mentioned uh like nimble mongoose i know tarmogoyf is a big one um uh the grixis variants they run um what's his name the fish uh Ger germag angler mm -hmm. so so why are these types like what what is special about these creatures and why are they important to the to the delver archetypes so every single delver strategy you'll see plays as some sort of two drop um you know in, in bug and uh rug you you play tarmogoyf in the jeskai version which is it actually ex excuse that other one drop i talked about you know how it's it, i would i think jeskai is by far the worst type of delver deck and part part of that reason is because you don't get another good one drop creature like like rug and bug and Grix grixis um, but yeah, so in that deck, you play Stoneforge Mystic, and in my version of Grixis, I play Young Pyromancer in the two-drop slot. But each one is important, and they serve a different role, and like, generally those creatures are like, the more powerful ones, and they're like your best late-game top decks, so. Okay. And then, um, in, in some of the, the specific variants, like, um, in, uh, Teamer Delver or Rug Delver, you have Nimble Mongoose, he, he, he's important because of having, um, like he's hard to kill, right? He has shroud, so he's sort of a, a threat that's that's really hard to deal with. So I guess you have a little more resiliency there. Um, the the Grixis version, you get Gurmag Angler, which I guess is basically just like the biggest threat around. Like there's typically yep. no larger creature than that. And I know they don't usually run it as a four of, but but it, it's it's the big guy, right? So if you have to yeah. go over top of Tarmogoyfs or something like that. Yeah, and it's good thing you mentioned that because Gurmag Angler is, serves an important role, not just as a big fatty, but the Grixis Delver deck doesn't have, I mean, it's not uncommon, but, um, or sorry, not that, but you don't have an answer to Tarmogoyf um, in the main deck. You know, you, nobody really plays Murderous Cut or Dismember in the main deck, and Gurmag Angler itself is an answer to Tarmogoyf. Um, right. Because gen normally, Goyfs don't get bigger than 4-5. Mm -hmm. um, so it plays a big role in that. Um, and back to the Nimble Mongoose thing, um, that's a, a type of card that is really, it's really not the best in the first few turns of the game. You know, normally it's just a one-one, but it's really, really great versus the other fair decks in the format, like Shardless Bug and Miracles and other Delver decks, because the games go long and they can't kill it, and it's a resilient threat. Um, you know, so that's why that card shines. Right. Um, so and then and then the the remaining spells, they're all sort of uh, we'll lump them into disruption. So so you have cards like Lightning Bolt. Some run Abrupt Decay. Um, some I, I guess the Jeskai variants, which you've, you've we've sort of noted aren't aren't quite as strong typically. That um, mm -hmm. they have Swords to Plowshares and Lightning Bolts typically. And then and then your your Counter Suite, which always includes Days and Force of Will. Sometimes you'll see things like. Spell Pierce or Flusterstorm. Um, I don't know that they run. I guess maybe Pyroblast if the metagame is is yeah. sufficiently the, warped. The black variants get to play discard spells. Like Bug will typically you'll typically see him to Torak or Thoughtseize in the main deck, and mm -hmm. the Grixis versions get to play Cabal Therapy. And these are all these are all really part of the the tempo plan, right? This is the it's, let let's, crucial let's for it. maintain um, our board state by interrupting what our opponent is able to do. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Um, something, yeah, that, that's all true. And something I, like, as a general rule, I tell people when they say, like, hey, I'm just picking up a Delver deck, you know, how do I play it? It's not really, like, typically it's a good idea to just, every time your opponent casts something, if you can do something to stop it, you should. That's why you put, also, Stifle is normally a four of in a lot of different Delver archetypes. And, yeah, when your opponent casts a spell, if you can daze it, you daze it. If you can spell pierce it, you spell pierce it. It's just, 
the way the deck operates, you need to take advantage of those cards, and you got to make sure they don't die. Like they they're not relevant later in the game, you know. Right now, you you mentioned a card which is it's sort of it from my experience and and in my opinion, there, there's like two two divisions of the Delver decks, uh, other than just their colors and you know and the different the different uh, flavors. There's the Stifle versions versus the the versions that don't run Stifle. Now, most commonly, at least in my experience, the versions that don't run stifle are the ones that are that are running like death right shaman and and more green spells typically with the exception of teamer which is all in on stifle now do you have any insight as to to why the split and is one superior to the other like are, are you intentionally picking one over the other or, or is there a reason like a, a metagame call or something like that um no there's almost never a metagame call for why you should play stifle or not but um, something you said is it's, it's essential for Team or Delver. Well, I do think that's true nowadays. Um, I've played many, many turns with Team or Delver with no stifles, um, like when I first started playing the deck. Mm -hmm. And I, I, didn't, I don't necessarily think it's wrong. Like, it just kind, kind of depends where you're at. And, like, stifle is not a great card. Uh, normally, you'll, that's another card where you just use it at any given opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, like, I've seen, I've seen the stifle, and you're right about... Most of the Death Rite Shaman builds, like Bug and Grixis, probably don't run Stifle. That's a good point. Uh, mostly because those decks can take advantage of the late game better um, mm -hmm. with cards like Tarmogoy for Gurmag Angler, Death Rite Shaman. Um, they have better late game than Teamer Delver, which is why they don't necessarily need to, you know, mana screw your opponent early and win with on the backhand of Stifle. But I have seen Stifle in every single Delver variant. I've seen it in Jeskai. I've seen it in Bug, all of them. Even though now I think the stock... Uh, for all the Delver decks is just the Rogue Delver deck, or Teamer, sorry, plays uh, Stifle. And normally you won't see it in Soltai or Grixis or Just Guys. So. And, that, and that makes sense because in a lot, I've, I've seen a lot of people claim that, that teamers, uh, teamer's heyday has passed. Like it is no longer the top Delver deck and it's clinging to Stifles as its only way to still be relevant. Mm -hmm. I I completely agree with that. Yeah, you you sort of it feels like they're really banking on the the just total wasteland mana screw your opponent out of the game plan because their creatures are pretty noticeably inferior to most of the other uh, Delver variants at mm -hmm. this point. Yep. So. Like Nimmamongus is just such a worse card than Death Rite Shaman. Yeah, he's not um, not the unstoppable threat he used to be. Exactly. Um, and one thing I just wanted to comment about that is um, with I, I haven't played Rug Delver since the printing of Delve cards. And I think because you have to play Nimble Mongoose, I really think it is a mistake to not play Delve cards in a format where, you know, Legacy, you just fill up your graveyard so quickly. And in a Delver deck, especially with all the cheap cantrips and all the, and all the free counter spells, I think it's a mistake not to play any Delve cards. Right. Yeah, and, we, and we've seen... Uh, it, in the last year or so, the the power of Delve cards, not only the ones that got banned, which were incredibly powerful, yes. but arguably too powerful, but also yes. just the, the like the lesser powerful ones are still great. We've, we've already mm -hmm. mentioned how awesome Gurmag Angler is, but cards like like Tassiger, even though even though Caracas is a card, Tassiger still like lingers. Seen play. Um, Murderous Cut has proven that it's like at least a one of, sometimes a, a sideboard extra. It's completely viable in that regard. I know not in Legacy as much, but in Modern, people are, are, are trying uh, Hooting Mandrels with yep. some regularity in, in the, the Teamer versions. And I actually wonder, uh, uh, let me get your opinion while we're on the topic, would Teamer Delver, the, the, the old Stifle style deck, would that be better served trying to work um, Hooting Mandrels in? Is, is that a possible way for it to become relevant again in, in place of the... Uh, the mongoose or or is it still just outclassed by the uh, existing delver decks well so i wouldn't say that the deck isn't relevant anymore plenty of people still choose to play team or delver it's mm -hmm. always a solid choice but um <laughs> i have considered working he hooting mandrels into the deck i really have but the problem that that brings along is then you have to cut your second one drop creature which i think is really important because mm -hmm. then you i mean you could play monastery swift spear but at that point then you're already at 14, 16 creatures, which is borderline a little too much mm -hmm. for Delver. Um, but I think there's definitely, you could maybe work out a deck with, excuse me, um, maybe Monastery Swift Spear or Curd Ape. Uh, Daryl Ayers won a, right. won a Legacy Open with Curd Ape. 
um, in his in his team or Delver deck to play Treasure Cruise. Um, and I think it's not unreasonable to show up with maybe one of those red creatures as your second one drop and then play two to three Hooting Mandrels. Um, I definitely think that's something that should be explored, um, but I can't confidently say it's the correct way to build Rug Delver. Right. Yeah, and I mean, uh, I've noticed that most of the Delver variants outside of Teamer do run like 14-ish creatures usually instead, so maybe maybe that's the swap we're looking for or should be looking for, but I guess... Yeah, maybe, uh, that's, maybe that's what would push that deck back into the top, the top Delver deck. So... Well, I'm not the guy who usually plays the Delver decks, but maybe uh, if you get a chance, you can let me know how how that how that works out. Yeah, I'd love to test it. So, um, why do you choose to play Delver decks? Obviously, you've played a whole bunch of them, um, mm -hmm. and and if you've played all the variants, something about them really appeals to you. Like, what is that, and 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 why do you continue? Like, what what is it? What what makes them so compelling? Well. Um... For starters, I love blue decks. I've always been a big fan of playing blue cards and tempo or control type archetypes. Those are my favorites. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the type of magic I like to play is long, interactive, grindy games where you know I can kind of leverage my skill to get small advantages. I really like playing that that type of game. But uh, the real reason is in 2012 when I was when I started playing Legacy, um, the deck I had been playing all standard format was Blue White Delver, and that's really what like started making me play seriously. I was I was a, just a casual until I, I bought the blue white Delver deck and I was like wow this deck is great mm -hmm. I want to start going to you know large tournaments with it um, and you know I didn't really have any major success with it besides a lot winning local tournaments but it was just kind of a natural transition to pick up Teamer Delver which was already one of the best performing legacy decks mm -hmm. um, for my first legacy event which was Grand Prix Atlanta in 2012 um, so it was just yeah it was just natural for me to pick up blue white Del or to pick up Teamer Delver from the transition of blue white. And, you know, like, fundamentally, they play the same type of game plan. The cards are different, but they play very similarly. So, like, the first the first tournament I ever played uh, Teamer Delver in was just a local uh, Legacy IQ, and I split the finals of it, and, like, I, I immediately just knew, like, this is the deck for me. It was just, it was really, like, I just felt like I could play it comfortably after playing a year of Blue White Delver and Standard. Um, so I kind of just never put it down. I've dabbled with other decks in Legacy um, before, but at all the major tournaments, you'll it's hard that you'll it's like unlikely you'll ever see me not playing Dilver. No, uh, and I I've I've noticed that with a lot of Legacy players or people who play Legacy regularly anyway, they 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 branch out and try things. But when you find what you're good at and what you like, and and a lot of times what you have the most practice with, you know, it's it's, it's the comfort level. You stick to it. It's a exactly. format that allows that. Exactly. And I just, I, I think that's so true. And I'm a type of person where I feel like metagaming is really overvalued in Magic. And I value comfort level with a strategy a lot more than, you know, playing the deck for the weekend or playing the best deck. I 100%. Think comfort level is a lot more important than that. Yeah, definitely, definitely agree with that. I've, I've never if you're going to play the best fan. deck suboptimally, but you're, you're going to play your, your, your pet deck better, probably should just play the one you're not going to make as many mistakes with. That's right. Especially if you're going to get on camera. I mean, you don't want to be making mistakes. Yeah, exactly. People know. It's, it's archived then. Plenty of plenty of mistakes with Delver on camera. So, <laughs> yeah. God forbid I was playing a deck like Miracles or something. Yeah, where people can really chew you out. <laughs> yeah. So, now that you have all this experience with Delver, you're probably a good person to tell us, what is Delver best against? Like, what, what are the strengths of the deck? And, and what, like, what kind of game do you want to play? And what decks do you want to play against? So, Delver's kind of a weird in a weird spot where there's basically no matchup that's better than 60%, 55%. It's kind of like 50-50 versus the whole field, aside from lands. Lands is just hopeless. Um, but like all the other strategies, you, you're, you know, no better than 55, 60%. And, you know, some people might look at that as a bad thing. Like, oh, why wouldn't you want to have, you know, good matchups across, you know, half the field or whatever. But I look at it as a great thing because Delver – no matter what I sit across from at the table, I'm confident that I can beat them with Delver because you can always have a fast start with a Delver and a Daze and a Wasteland or something, mm -hmm. and you can always beat people like that. So um, the matchups I want to play versus in a tournament, I think Elves is pretty strong. I don't really lose that deck much. I think, um, that, you know, that's like honestly... Oh, actually, Reanimator. Reanimator is something I've found pretty easy, especially for the Death Rite Shaman builds. Sure. The combination of uh, Disruption plus Discard 
and and fast creatures or fast pressure as well as just having a main deck hate card yeah. it's really really tough for them to beat so like sneak and show and reanimator i would say i would like to play versus every like almost every round but uh you know going back to what i said you know i think no matchups really worse than 40 percent than by besides lands so um yeah there's not many decks i'm like always hoping to play against but there isn't really any decks that i'm not hoping to play against either so yeah and in that case lands is one of those decks that has enough of its own flaws that like if you can if you can dodge it or get really lucky for a round or two all the really bad pilots get killed off by like guys who are good at miracles or people playing storm or something like that so and and lands is a really tough deck to play and not to mention like the card availability for the deck is a real thing. Like Tabernacle's not a card that a lot of people have access to. And uh, Rashad and Port's very expensive too. So. Yeah, the deck is incredibly expensive to build. So yeah, you, you certainly eliminate uh, your odds of running into it just by availability, you're right. Yeah, and Lands is a deck that I think a lot more people would play if Tabernacle was 300 less dollars. Like, it's probably you, don't, true. you just don't see that much Lands at events. You know, normally you just see the name players who, like Daryl Ayers and uh, Chris Anderson, uh... Oh my, I'm blanking on his name, the guy who always wins. David Long. David Long, yeah. Yes. Um, you know, those are the players who everyone knows as Lands players, but that's because they've been playing the deck for years. Um, you know, not a, not many people are going to just go out and get a Tabernacle and pick up Lands, you know? Right. Yeah. And even some of the other Lands, like, well, I realize this is a Delver Delver uh, uh, interview, but we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll aside Re- here. Re- yeah, get the, into Lands. It, it, because, because cost of entry to a format is a very real thing, and I think... There are a fair number of people who 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 skew towards Delver decks, maybe even more than than you would think should be represented, because it's relatively inexpensive compared to at least yes. at least even even not inexpensive in the sense of like it doesn't cost you know every legacy deck costs a fortune to build. Mm-hmm. It's when you buy into it, the the cards are malleable. Like if you end up not liking it you haven't dumped $800 into a tabernacle that you can no longer use when you want to switch decks. Like, yeah. your volcanic islands are still good elsewhere. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, yeah, you know, honestly, you couldn't have said it better. So, w- we talked about what Delver's good against, and you've sort of alluded to, but uh, let's see if, we, if there's anything else. Are there any decks that are really good against Delver decks? Like, what are the weaknesses of the Delver archetype? So, naturally, lands is um, one, and then... Um, the abrupt decay strategies, uh, bug and or shardless bug and jund, are definitely yeah. tougher matchups. The ones I don't want to sit sit across from every round, but they're very winnable, obviously. Um, but just naturally, their their card quality is a lot higher than yours. They can grind. They can stall out the game long enough to where their ancestral visions and baleful strix really bury you in card advantage. Um, same with punishing fire and bloodbraid elf and jund. Um, so those matchups are definitely unfavorable. But be, that being said, I still don't think they're worse than 45-55. Right. Um, and I Miracles agree. falls under that, too. I, I've always felt like, as a Delver player, besides when I play Rug Delver, because Nimble Mongoose is such a house versus Miracles, mm-hmm. um, but with all the other Delver strategies, I've felt at, like that Miracles is an uphill battle because sure. same reasons, they can, they can grind it. They can make sure the game stalls out, and then they'll beat you with their better cards. Yep. Um, but, again... Not really worse than 40, 60, 45, 55. Okay. So let's go into to Grixis Delver. That's the variant that you've played the most recently and mm-hmm. probably had the most success with in the last uh, <clears throat> year anyway. Yeah, very true. So that's that's your current um, current choice. So mm-hmm. uh, specifically, um, what should people sideboard or what is good out of the sideboard against Grixis Delver? Like what, what should they bring to fight you? Um, Dark Blast and like, is it Staticaster, Fork Bolt? These are all cards that really, really shine. Normally, you can get multiple creatures with them with just one card. Mm-hmm. Um, so those those cards are great. I've been Engineered Plagued before, which is very, very good versus Delver. Or, yeah, Delver and Young Pyromancer. Oh, on um, Human. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I've actually been uh, plagued on Wizard before too, which gets my Vendillion click as well. Um, Ooh. Oh yeah, but, because Delver of Secrets is a is a human wizard. Human wizard. Oh yep. wow. <laughs> um, so like yeah, a lot of the like minus one minus one cards, those are really strong. Um, really, just cheap removal is kind of the best way to attack Delver. Baleful Strix is a total house because you got to get it out of the you got to get it off the board, and they get a card out of it. Yeah. So it's it's really hard to 
you know, beat, beat, not, and it's not hard to beat Baleful Strikes, but it's just very, very good versus you. Sure. Um, so those are kind of the natural cards on, uh, that are good versus Delver. At least out of, yeah, sideboard type things. Yeah. Um, I know with, with some of the, like, like Teamer Delver, Graveyard Hate was always really good against them. Yes. Relic um, of Genesis, rest in peace. And even versus Grixis, it's good too. Is it? Okay. Yeah. So if your deck can afford to to swap, or if it has, you know, if effectively dead cards to swap out, Graveyard Hate is also pretty effective against against most yeah. of the Delvers, right? Yeah, yeah. It, I'd say it shines best versus Teamer and Bug, mm -hmm. um, the Timer Goy versions. Sure. But it's still very effective versus Grixis between Cabal Therapy, Delve Interactions, and Death Rate Shaman. Yeah. Um, so those cards are definitely really good. Okay, so when when you're sideboarding with Grixis Delver and yeah. you're and you're planning for for people bringing things in against you, what what is your anti hate hate? Like what what do you sideboard to stop the people coming that are coming after you? So nothing specific, but th like um, as a general rule with Delver, I don't cut days on the play versus any deck. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't, and this is something I learned from Jacob Wilson, who's the best Delver player in the world, maybe even the best legacy player in the world. Um, I never cut more than two Force of Wills versus any deck on the draw, um, just because, you know, you you have to expect good sideboard cards against you, and the tempo is just too important. You can't afford to fall behind versus, you know, certain decks. And it's really crucial to have a free counterspell on the draw, because also something I forgot to mention is on the draw, Versus most decks, you cut all your dazes, but except for sure. the combo decks, really. Um, so when you have to cut all your dazes, you can't afford to just board out all your force of wills and have no free counter spells. Right. Um, and that's something like that a lot of newer legacy players will make the mistake of. You know, they hear that force of will is bad in all the fair matchups, just board out your force of wills. And that, well, that that is true. It's not good because it's card disadvantage. You can't, like I just said, you can't afford to just have no counters. You know, you, there was the type of deck where you know, you might need to force a will of lightning bolt on your turn one Delver because that's your only threat, and you can't you can't just have no no answers. You know. Yeah, you can't you can't force a will of uh, lightning bolt if you don't have force of wills anymore. So yeah. that, that makes sense. And I, I actually have encountered the same the same um, experience um, where you get this like uh, general sideboarding techniques that people people want like how do I sideboard versus this or how do I or, you know or is force of will the kind of card I should be taking out in fair matchups, like you said? And people mm. will, will blanket statement like that. Oh yeah, you, you know, force of will is terrible against uh, against shardless because they have so much card advantage. And yep. I and I disagree for the same reason. I think if your deck relies on winning via tempo and staying ahead of your opponent, you can't you can't give up every source of tempo. Like exactly. if you do that, then you then you're just a, a worse version of what they do. And yeah, how can you possibly win that? That's exactly what I was going to say, and you can't afford to play the card advantage deck or the card advantage game with a deck like Shardless Bug or Jund. They're just going to bury you to the ground because all their cards are so much better. So you have to be able to capitalize on the tempo of Force of Will. Now, I want to I want to uh, pick your brain for a little bit of insight on that while we're sort of on the topic. There's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of um, very specific deck building strategy put into to decks, and, and I know for a fact Delver's, Delver variants are one of these because they're, because they're tempo decks, mm -hmm. that <clears throat> people frequently will like over sideboard, or they, they take out too much of the core of a deck, and, and I wanted to know, do you, like, what has your experience been with, like, the, you know, along that, that line like did you used to do that or what was your did you have like the aha moment where like oh i, I gotta stop doing this because that's what's costing me these matchups because i'm i'm not doing what i'm supposed to do by trying to like fight everything from you know like all these different angles yeah um yeah there was like a crucial point in my magic career so i think in like 2013 where i re i just i kept over sideboarding and like dil exactly what you said diluting my deck of you know uh you know Whatever it may be, like if, if you're playing elves or something, I see a lot of people bring in a bunch of abrupt decays or pithing needle to stop something or like wasteland or something, you know, and they're taking out crucial elements of their deck. And you just, you know, even though these cards are good in the matchup or whatever, you can't afford to dilute your deck like that. Right. Um, especially with a, a con like Delver, it's kind of hard because you don't have like your crucial cards like Delver or your creatures and you don't really cut those in any matchups. Um, but I think that logic kind of applies more to combo decks where I see a lot of Storm players board in six, seven cards 
and you know at that point they have to take out cantrips and rituals and you know at that right. point what are you even doing you know you're just diluting your deck of the cards that you need to kill them yeah i guess you can we can sort of summarize it as like don't don't sacrifice the power of your deck to try and beat the power of someone else's deck like you you yes. can you can try and fight them and you should obviously but mm. you can't do it at the cost of your own game plan yeah that's a great way to put it all right so Let's talk about Delver players. You're a Delver player. Yep. What 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 makes a person want to play a Delver deck? Like what type of person should should play it? What you know? Why are you attracted to it? Well, we sort of talked about that, but what, bit, yeah. what should they want? Like what should attract them to it? And what type of player should should be a Delver player? Yeah. So um, a lot of players obviously they love their blue cards. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some people will just play control until they die. You know, they'll just play in every single format, no matter if it's good. You know, a good example of that is Guillaume Wafotapo or mm -hmm. Andrew Cuneo to an extent. Um, Shaheen Zarani. She, yeah, perfect example right there. Um, and those are kind of the, like, you know, blue players who enjoy, te like, the type of magic I just, I described earlier where, you know, you get to play long, grindy games where you kind of get to leverage your play skill. Um, not, not necessarily saying that you have to be like an insanely good player to play Delver, but those are the type of players that I think lean towards the archetype. People that like aggro control decks, people who like playing with counter spells, people who like manipulating the top of their library, um, you know, and some people don't like that. Some people like to just have a bunch of powerful cards in their deck and that's it. You know, they just want to have a bunch of mana and be able to cast all their powerful cards, but they sacrifice the consistency aspect of it because they don't get to play the manipulation like Ponder and Brainstorm. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Are oh, you good? So, so people who want to uh, maxi min, I guess they they want to have more control over the inches gained instead of just just you know hail marys every every play. Yes. Well, that makes exactly. sense. And 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 I've noticed that there are a lot of players, especially uh, more, more like the pro players or the or the the higher the more successful ones, let's phrase it that way, that they gravitate towards those kind of decks. And do you think that has more to do with just the desire to leverage play skill over power? Or, or is it just a, you know, is it just a fluke? Um, yeah, you know, that's kind of true. Where uh, you're not wrong that like a lot of pro players lean towards, you know, if they're going to play Legacy, you know, they're going to want to play Ponder and Brainstorm. But just because you have more control of what's going on, you know, if... You're not just gonna lose all the time because you get mana screwed one round or because you draw the wrong half of your deck. You know, when you get to filter through your deck every single turn, you can really pick pinpoint what you want. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's why a lot of the pro players gravitate towards that deck. But I generally think people think that all the pro players like to play their blue cards or whatever, or they, you know, whatever it is. I don't think that's necessarily true all the time. But I mean, you're not you're not wrong, but. It's. I think people tend to think it's more true than it really is. Um, you okay. know, but like the, the best players will play whatever they think is the, the best deck for them or the best deck for the weekend, not necessarily just the one that they have the most control over, you know? Okay. So would you say that there's like a high uh, skill barrier to learning how to, to play a Delver deck? And and should, and if, if it should, how should that play into their decision to, you know, to learn a Delver deck and to play that at a, at a Legacy event? Um, yeah, so I think Delver's a really, really, like, it's not a hard deck to play at 75, 80%. Um, you know, like I said, you can use that general rule of if I can counter or stop whatever my opponent's doing, stop it. You know, mm -hmm. you can use that rule. You can, you know, get free wins off a Delver, a fl early flip Delver and a Wasteland or whatever. You know, you can just play a turn one Wasteland and Wasteland your opponent's only land. That's a free win right there. Um, so it's not hard to play Delver at like you know three-fourths of optim optimally but uh i think it's really hard to play you know close to 100 percent. the the jacob wilson's and the bob longs of the world you know right well and there's there's probably some something to be said too about um about like getting good with your deck and and learning it that, that like you can't ever attain that 100 percent until you've until you've overcome that skill barrier so yeah. like well i think you can never attain that 100 that, that's Imagine. probably a good argument yeah but you can get really close, for sure. So tell us, uh, what was one of your favorite moments playing a Delver deck? Like, how did it happen? What did you do? Why was it so special? Um, the one that really sticks out to mind was uh, when I played versus Chris Anderson at uh, the SCG in DC, actually, where we met. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I was playing four top eight. I was 11 and one. 
And I my opening hand had a, my Dread of Night. And he was playing uh, Death and Taxes. Mm-hmm. So I'm just like, this game is going to be easy. You know, there's just sure. no way I can lose this game. But uh, and I was on the draw, and I led off with a turn one Death Rite Shaman. And he Swords to Plow shares it and Wasteland in my only land. Uh, my only black land. Mm-hmm. And I end up just like breaking off draw sets forever. He rests in peace me. Um, and uh, he had a Mother Ruins and two Flicker Wisps attacking me. And I was really, really frustrated. As you see it on camera, you know, I, I was this close to losing this game where I had my opening, my, my hate card in my opening hand. And on the last possible turn, I'm at seven life. He has seven power in play. I rip a Flooded Strand to fetch for the Underground Sea and wrap his entire board. And, you know, from there, I mean, he actually drew uh, Fire Extinct Revoker followed by Sarah Avenger after. But I was from there, I was easily, I was able to take over. But that was a really memorable moment because, you know, I, it locked me for top eight. And just the frustration of my hate card has been in my opening hand and I just didn't cast it on turn one. And, like, I was like, did I make a mistake? Did, was this going to cost me the top eight? Like, you know, and then finally drawing the land on the po- last possible turn. It, it was really awesome. So that mm-hmm. one sticks out. Was that your? You, did you say that was your first first top eight, or was that just? No, no, that was that was my most recent one. Oh, sticks. your most recent one. Okay, okay. Yeah, um, but it, yeah, yeah. So, awesome. Well, that that sounds awesome. Yeah, I mean, the comeback stories are some of the best, right? Like you, you just yeah. love it when things finally finally break your way, or you get lucky, and there it was. Yeah, and one other notable one was like when I was playing for the top eight of the Invitational, um, and I played the blue red Delver Mirror. Mm-hmm. And I probed my opponent, and I saw Bonfire of the Damned in his hand. And he only had two mana. And I had a bunch of Pyromancer tokens and, um, and a Pyromancer in play, obviously. And I decided, like, it, like, it was going to be, like, one of the last possible turns. And I decided to, like, play a second one to present Lethal and just hope he didn't feel the third land for his Bonfire. And he didn't. <laughs> and, oh, man. You know, that, you know, it was a, it was a you know... It was a risky decision, but I, I think it was the right one. And, uh, you know, it was uh, that one was that one sticks out, too, for sure. No guts, no glory, right? Yep. yep. Well, while we're on the topic of making the top eight of an Invitational, you only made it to the top eight of one Invitational, but you made that one count. Mm-hmm. So you currently are the elemental token on the Star City Open Series, or the Star City Games Tour, I guess it's called now. One of them, yeah. Yeah, well, Chris, one, one of them, Peter, yeah. probably the probably the the more common one now just because it's the, yeah. the most recent. So, uh, although it seems obvious, why did you choose the elemental token? And uh, what does winning the Invitational and being represented on the uh, that iconic token mean to you? Um, so I chose the token because uh, I wanted to... Like something I I wanted to make sure with my token is that I could play with it. Um, mm-hmm. I I actually really wanted to pick a Master of Waves Elemental because I played Mono Blue the whole standard format prior. But then I like thought about it and I was like, well, I'm not, I don't play Merfolk and Modern, and I really don't think I'll ever get to use this. So I wanted to make sure I could use my token, and the Elemental is something I think I'll be able to use for basically the rest of time. You know, Young Pyromancer is a staple of Vintage and Legacy and Modern to an extent. So mm-hmm. I don't think there's really ever going to be a point in Magic where I'm not able to use my own token, which is a good feeling. Um, and what it means is that it was incredible. Like, just that was kind of the transition to my point where, you know, people kind of referred to me as, like, a pro player, which mm-hmm. I still to this day don't consider myself a professional Magic player. You know, I'm here at college. This is my priority. But, you know, to an extent, I guess you could say I'm a semi-pro. And, like, that was, you know, after I won that Invitational, people started asking me to sign their cards and their playmats and tell me they were, I was their favorite Magic Pro. So, like, it was just a huge transition for me after mm-hmm. winning that tournament. Um, and it was awesome, obviously. And, you know. now, so has, has the fame affected you, or are you still the same Dylan from, uh, from two years oh, ago? I'm the same Dylan. <laughs> That's good to hear. Well, yeah. Dylan, it has been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for making time to join us today, and thank you for sharing your insight and your perspectives on the Delver Archetypes. Yeah, thanks for having me, Zach. I was really happy to do it. No problem. And thank you to all of our listeners and our viewers. It has been a pleasure to bring you this episode of Legacies of Lore. If you like what you heard today, please subscribe and feel free to leave us feedback on our YouTube page. Or you can message me directly at mtgtraininggrounds at gmail.com. I am your host, Zachary Cuck. Thank you for joining us. I'm